okay? But as far as the information, all of that has to stay the same. That way it's fair. Everyone has the same amount of time to spend on it, okay? So we'll get through chapter 46. We'll go through the next one, Rickettsia protozoas, and then I'll try to figure out a day for y'all to get all that to me. And you said we have to, like, bring something to the next one. You don't have to. You get bonus points if you dress up or bring food. Okay. So are we looking at
they get put in trematodes or cestodes based on their characteristics. The characteristics of these guys, um, they're also called flatworms. Okay, so they're not round, smooth, and cylindrical. They're kind of flat, like you took a, the best way to describe it is if you take like a paper towel roll and when you smash it, so they are still kind of round, but then you smash that paper towel down and they're still flat. Um, so your eustest, your eustestodes are your true tapeworms, okay? Um, there are some things we'll talk about called pseudo tapeworms. Um, do y'all remember from midterm what pseudo means? False. False. So pseudo tapeworm means what? False. So it kind of wants to be a tapeworm. It looks like a tapeworm, but it's not really a tapeworm. Okay, so that's like a pseudo tapeworm. Um, and y'all will probably talk about like pseudo pregnancies. Have y'all talked about that yet? Mm -hmm. Yes, a little bit. Okay. Um, so this is a really cool picture, actually. So what do you notice about this worm? It's, 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 it's segmented. Okay, it's not one long smooth worm like our nematodes are. It's a worm that has kind of is compartmentalized. Okay, it has different segments of itself. Is each segment for the body? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll yes, we'll get there. Um, so when we talk about our acanthos, um, all acantho means is like thorny or spiky. Um, so these are thorny headed worms. We don't spend a ton of time on them because we don't see them very often in our companion animals. Um, it's very rare that they are encountered. Um, they are kind of just set apart based off their name because they do have that club like or spike like um, head to themselves. Something else, if y'all just want to remember the acantho portion of that word, it does mean like burrs or spikes. Um, when we get into hematology, there are certain red blood cell abnormalities that are called acanthocytes um, because they're spiculated or spiky red blood cells. So, so what, what, are they usually found hmm? what species are they usually found in? These guys are, either, are going to be more in your like exotic type species, like not in North America. Like rainforest areas, super, super tropical. Um, your like primates, can, huh? Like yeah, like your Amazon species, yeah. Um, some of your primates can have them, some of your avian species can have them, um, but we won't encounter them here in our companion animals. Okay? Um, so, a tapeworm. If you want to highlight that first part or underline it, um, they always have an indirect life cycle. Okay? They always will have an intermediate host. Okay? So sometimes your roundworms and your hookworms can be indirect or direct. So it can be straight, you know, nose to egg, or it can be they get it from another host. Um, tapeworms must have the intermediate host. They will always be indirect. Do y'all remember who I said their indirect meteor, intermediate host is? Lee. Lee. So for the tapeworm, the diplidium caninum, which is going to be the main common one we're going to talk about here in a little bit, the flea is the intermediate host. Okay. As far as tapeworms as a whole, your book just says arthropods, um, some fish, um, some small mammals, but really just stick to your arthropod guys. Um, so arthropods are what? Do you remember? Okay. So really anything with an exoskeleton. Okay. So like. Something that has a hard exterior are going to be your arthropods. Um, in this instance, it's going to be a flea. So, okay. like, it, like a flea that it's almost like an adult, or does it have to be? Um, it can be the flea larvae. Usually, it's the flea larva that the animal ingests, um, or the flea larva feed on the diplidium caninum. So, when the flea larva grow into adults and then they start feeding on our animals, then our animals are grooming, they ingest the adult. So it's the flea larva that eats the diplidium canine of the actual tapeworm. Um, so your domestic animals can be definitive hosts um, and or intermediate hosts. Okay, so they can kind of go there and just hang out for a little bit and move on, or they can go there, stay, and thrive. Okay, so we kind of talked about it a little bit, but we know that a flea is an intermediate host for a tapeworm, right? So if you have a lady come in, or not a lady, it doesn't have to be a woman, if an owner brings their animal in with tapeworms, what's the other issue you have to address to them? Flea, Flea prevention. prevention. Okay. For whatever reason, um, people sometimes get offended if you try to tell them that their animal has fleas. Um, 
it's kind of one of those things that you want to tread lightly, but you also need to like give them the black and white facts, like, hey, you know, tapeworms come from this. Um, so you want to try to talk to them about that. You don't want to be mean or like obviously say you're dirty or whatever, but people do get offended when you try to talk to them about their animal having fleas. Um, so just, you know, tell them, you know, we have tapeworms, you know, we see in the past you bought XYZ type of preventative. Would you want to get that while you're here? Um, there's ways you can go about it, but you have to make sure that they don't leave that clinic without knowing that if that flea issue or flea, wherever they're coming from, isn't addressed, what's going to happen? They're just going to get reinfected with tapeworms. Yeah, we'll deworm them. That specific worm's life cycle will end, but there's just going to be other ones if we have fleas somewhere. Okay. Yes, Anna. So if, let's say you take your animal over to someone else's house and bring it back, would you still make it, like, be just, like, outside in the environment in that case? Of your house? Yes. I would. Um, especially if you had your animal at their house, whether it came from their house or not, you still brought them back with you. If you're, if it's gotten to the point where your animal is perhaps being forgotten or truly infested with your diplodium canine, um, um, and as far as like getting rid of the fleas, we need to put them on prevention. Yes, but you also want to treat the bedding, the house, the yard, or whatever. And a lot of the pest control people, if you just call them and say, "Hey, I need you to come treat my yard for fleas," or they'll, they have chemicals that will do that. Um, it's not anything like crazy, and I don't think it's relative. It's not super expensive. Um, so it is something that in the long run is going to help our animals on two different sides. Not only the flea side of it, but also the tapeworm side of it. And I mean, if you think about it, people that live in, you know, out in the woods, there's all sorts of animals and whatever. And then people are like, oh, well, I have, that. I have a fenced in backyard. A lot of people will say that when you try to talk to them about fleas. Um, but there's birds that fly out, I mean, everywhere, squirrels, rabbits, they all harbor the same fleas that our dogs and cats do. Um, and sometimes people don't realize that. And it's not that they, they just don't know. They don't have that education part of it. So that's where treating the yard comes in handy, too. Um, because you are going to have squirrels, birds, rabbits, whatever. Yeah, you have a fence, but that doesn't mean you're going to keep everything out. Um, so you can kind of keep that little control, controlled environment. So your eucestodes, okay, these are going to be your true tapeworm, guys. Um, they are multicellular, but they do not have a true body cavity. Okay, when you're talking about our nematodes, they had a true body cavity from, a, from top to bottom. Okay, and then they had different types of systems. Your true tapeworms have organs, but they're embedded loosely in the tissue of the worm. So the parenchyma or the just body tissue is where their organs are going to lie. Um, the body is dorsoventrally flattened. So dorso is where? Back ventral is where? So if they're dorsoventrally flattened, how do they look? So, I wish I had a freaking paper towel. That's the best way to do it, but that's okay. We'll talk because we're going to talk about some other mites that are ventrally that are opposite. So you have dorsoventral, and then you have some that are opposite. Um, so they are flattened. They have three regions that consist of their body. So the head or the scolex. Okay, that's this big creepy part up here. Okay, y'all see that? That's the head or the scolex of the worm. Um, it has two to four muscular suckers. Okay, why do you think it would have those? Right, so that's where it's going to latch on. Or, was that you, Cleo? Yeah, okay. So um, that's where it's going to latch on or try to feed. Um, and then some of their snouts can have hooks. So again, we have some hook-like projections that's going to help that worm or parasite stay put in the GI system. Because again, we're, de we're dealing with another intestinal parasite, so they want to be in the GI system somewhere. Whether that's small intestine, large intestine, cecum, they want to be in that general area. Okay? Um, and then they do have a neck. Um, it's sort of hard to differentiate between their scolex and their neck because um, they do kind of all run together. I don't know about y'all, but that thing looks super creepy, like if I saw that just laying in the road or on the sidewalk. But anyway, so then you get here, and then what do you see that start, starts happening right here? Segments. Then we're segmented start to like, like you can see where they physically stop. So okay. the little bitty brown thing on the top is that the acid secretes. Yeah, so these little guys are just suckers. See them all around, and then you've got one up here. It truly looks like something straight out of like a Tremors movie. Um, okay, so the body. Um, this is kind of where we get into our little proglottids. 
Um, that's what the segments are called. They are called <coughs> proglottids. Okay, if you want to like highlight that word or write that word down or underline it, you will need to know that word from here on out. Okay. Um, so the parts that are close to the neck are immature. Okay. As the proglottids mature, they kind of back down the worm. And as they become fully gravid proglottids, that's when they deconnect or disconnect from the worm. Okay, does anyone know what gravid proglottids mean or what a gravid means? Pregnant. 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 So just remember, a gravid proglottid, it's pregnant, it's about to bust, so it's going to be released. Okay? You say the closer, the more, the closer they get, the more mature. They're more immature. So the closer to the back they get, the more ready they are to be released. Okay, because that's where they're going to be released from. Um, and each proglottid itself has reproductive organs. So if each proglottid has reproductive organs, do you see how those proglottids are becoming gravid? Yes. And more and more gravid. Just like when humans are pregnant, you go through a pregnancy term, or animals, you go through a term before it's ready to come out. Okay? Same thing with these guys. Even though we're tiny little worms, we still have those organs there. We still have to wait for them to be ready to be released. Okay? And then when it's that gravid proglottid, it's fully matured, it's going to be released. Yes, I'm sorry. So with this heartworms, my way. Oh, you're good. With heartworms, we saw mm -hmm. that they're male and female. Are there male mm -hmm. and female tapeworms? Um, so these guys are going to kind of fall in the asexual type, so they can kind of not necessarily be one or the other, but they have both. So they have both reproductive organ in each little proglotta that they have. Okay. So, so kind of hermaphroditic, but not all the way to say it's an hermaphrodite. So you're not gonna find like male or female, there's just one worm. Right, we're just all one worm and we just come off of that one. So kind of in that asexual realm, um, we don't have male and female like we do see with the, with the male heartworm. And what was what was um, characteristic of a male heartworm versus they're a short, female? They're short, they're they were smaller and they had the little cool tails. Or their coil to their tail. Okay. So do they ever run out of cells, or they just keep? They can just keep producing as long as that host is giving them the nutritional value they need. They'll just keep going, and as long as we don't come in and can you work take a while for that to happen? Do what? Does it take a while for that to happen? Um, it does. It doesn't take as long as you think. Um, uh, anywhere from two to three weeks, and they'll start popping off. Um, as they become more gravid or pregnant. That's what comes out of the back. Yeah. <clears throat> so these little things right here, that's what your owners see when they say, hey, my dog has worms and it looks like rice. Really, your dog has a worm and it's just reproducing and reproducing because it has its own little organs inside each sac. I don't know about y'all, but that, I mean, that's terrifying to me to think that each little one of those things just, I don't know, makes me think of like an assembly line like back in the old days when it just pops them out. But if you were to take one of those, so if someone came in and you got your little sticky tape or you got a tweezer and you were able to extract that from the animal safely and it was still intact, if I put that on a microscope and looked at it and show and like let the light shine through it, you would see tons of little tapeworm eggs. Okay? And I'll tell y'all now, a lot of times when people know their animal has tapeworms is when they're seeing the rice stuff on their bottom or in their stool. It's not necessarily because they're symptomatic. Um, so it is a little bit harder to find the true tapeworm oocyst on a fecal sample because a lot of times they're going to be passing the, the proglottid and then someone says something and sees it. So if I ever have animals that come in here and we do have the proglottids, I try to keep them for y'all um, to let y'all look at them because you can see through it and then you'll see the oocyst because it is a little bit harder to find them on fecal samples. Because usually you're, you're going to see the little rafts or the proglottids and be like, oh yeah, they have tapeworms. And you'll just treat them. Because that's confirmation right there. Okay? Questions about tapeworms? Or gravid proglottids? <clears throat> Anyone have any nightmares yet? About these guys? Or y'all also brain dead from your AMP test? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I didn't want to bring it up, but I figured that probably was the, was the case. You'll have to get close to being done with bones though, right? In lab? So we have a review next week and then we have a break. Oh, that'll be good. That's so nice that y'all are coming to review, though. Okay, so here's some more yummy, scary pictures. So here's its head. See these little hooks? 
Those are those hood light projections. Okay, and then that's obviously a piece of feces with papers. <laughs> Y'all would have known that, but your book says, hey, let's look at it. But you can see where somebody would look at that and say, oh, it looks like rice. Okay, or orzo if you're a pasta connoisseur. It looks like orzo pasta, too. Okay, so here's some more pictures. So this right here is actually two pergolatas that are still connected. That's what this picture is, okay? It's just on a really, really high power. Then if you take this, so all these little dark things in here, what's that? Those are the eggs. So then you take it down to a higher power, these are what your eggs look like, okay? How are you gonna tell those, the difference between those and like hooks and rounds? There's a bunch of different little ones, not one. Yes, you can see like this looks like a serving platter and you have a, sh a lot of grapes on it. That's what a lot of people say, or deviled eggs. Yes, I've heard deviled eggs. Um, a platter of deviled eggs. A lot of people just say a platter of grapes. Okay. What's the main difference between this OOCS and what you saw in the hookworm OOCS? It's not fit. Right. So your hookworm is not perfectly round. That's the one that's more oval. Okay. And the hookworm, remember, it looks like you just cracked a bunch of eggs in it before you started up to scramble them. Okay. These guys, you can see definitive eggs. Okay. Definitive little ellipsoids within that cell. Okay. Are you all with me? No, it's going to be more round like a roundworm. How would you tell that apart from a roundworm? Right, so they have the singular little ellipsoids in them, okay? Also, your tapeworm is the biggest oocyst you'll see. Okay, so as far as like I'm looking at it on a microscope, a tapeworm is going to be much larger in size than your roundworm. Okay? Sometimes people, there will be air bubbles on your slide that you come to, a lot of times your tapeworms are going to be around that same size. If you're lucky enough to see them in true OO6 form and not proglottid form. Okay, and which one's more common to find? The proglottids, because your people are going to see them being passed. Okay, but if you were to get that proglottid and stick it on a slide, it would look just like this. <coughs> and then you would go down to a higher power and you would go all the way down to be able to see the eggs themselves. Okay, um, I will try, if we ever get any in here, um, I will keep them for y'all. Typically, we don't see a lot of tapeworms. Um, sometimes, as it gets warmer, we might see some when the fleas kind of start to come back. Um, but a lot of these guys that just come from the shelter are going to kind of typically just have your nematodes. Okay, if any of y'all that work in clinics and get permission and you find some proglottid or some tapeworm or an animal that has stool with tapeworms in it, you're welcome to bring it to me, okay? And in the appropriate container. <laughs> um, and as long as you ask permission first. Don't just like, yeah, steal some samples and us all go look about it, talk about it, okay? And, and the only reason I ask that or talk about that is because it is harder to get this type of parasite in here for you guys to look at. Because I'm gonna tell y'all right now, um, parasites are a big bulk of your job um, and I try to get as much in here as I can, but we don't get a ton of sick animals in here because they're coming in from the shelter, okay? And our personal animals are on preventatives, so we don't get that. So as much as I can, I try to get y'all stuff in here, but the reality is I can't get as much in here as I would like, okay? Now, when it comes to us, when we start doing fecals in class, all I have to do is call BB Animal Shelter. They have a lot of poop, and they keep it for me, okay? They just, they literally will bring it in trash bags, okay? Um, the only issue with that is typically it's going to be just like your nematodes. There's probably not going to be a ton of your tapeworms. Okay. Um, same thing with heartworm positive animals. If we do get animals in here that are microfilaria positive, I try to keep their blood for y'all to look at. Um, that way we're not just practicing or going through the motions. You're actually physically getting to see it. Okay. Because that is a bulk and a big, big part of y'all's what you guys will do once you leave here. Who had a question? Oh, very much. Maybe my perky is going bad. Okay, so here's your eggs. We talked about them for a little bit. All right, any questions about true tapeworms? No. What's the little sacs called? That segment away from them? Proglottids. Okay. So your pseudo tapeworm, and pseudo tapeworm means what? False. False tapeworm. So 
they are very, very stromical. What is that word? What word did I even just say? Similar in structure um, to your true tapeworm. The only difference is <coughs> their reproductive tissue is centrally located. Okay, so with our true tapeworm, where was our reproductive organs? In every little. Right, in every little proglottid. Okay, so our false tapeworms have reproductive organs that are centrally located. Um, so the eggs are um, percolated and usually released from the uterus and passed in the feces. So what do you think the big difference between a pseudo tapeworm and a false tapeworm would be on our end of it? Or a pseudo tapeworm and a true tapeworm, sorry. Yes. What would our, what would our side of it be? Like how would we know, oh yes, this is a true tapeworm or this is a false tapeworm? Okay, you're on the right track with that. Are we not gonna see the stuff in the feces? You'll see, no, you won't the see the proglottids. Yeah. Right, with your true tapeworms you see proglottids, right? Mm -hmm. With your false tapeworms you're not going to, right? Because they have a centrally located reproductive system, okay? And we just said that they are passed into the, they are passed through the uterus and the eggs are passed in the feces, okay? So your true tapeworms are gonna be the ones that have the proglottids. So the veggies can't stay on the stem cells when they're not there? Or they're no, they can still be there. It'll just be like when we look for roundworms and hookworms. We don't usually see them until we see them on a fecal sample unless they're infested enough that they're passing the adult worms. But these guys wanna look like tapeworms and they'll be dorsoventrally flattened like tapeworms. They just won't have the individual little segments, but they'll look kind of ripply. But these guys are a lot less common. They still come from fleas? Hmm? They can't, parts of them, yes, can still come from fleas. Yeah. So will the um, oophat still oh, look sorry. very similar? Yes. Um, your oosis will look similar, yes, still. Are they going to be treated the same? Yes. Yep. Typically, your treatment is going to be the same. And again, with your false tapeworms, we don't see a ton of them around here anyway. Um, so typically, we're dealing with true tapeworms <coughs> more so than not. Um, I've never, ever been around false tapeworms or in, even seen them. Honestly, I didn't even know false tapeworms were a thing until I went to school. Like, I thought they were just tapeworms. Um, so, diplidium caninum. If you want to write that, or not write it down, highlight it, star it, underline it, whatever. This is your most common species of tapeworm that we deal with in domestic animals. Okay, diplidium caninum. Okay, and so as you guys can see up here, Here's our adult worm. So you can see up here, this is where the little body is, okay? Or her little body, whoever, its little body. And then as it comes back this way, what's starting to happen? Okay, this illustration I like because it shows how at the beginning there's nothing in them and then as it goes on, there's more and more eggs that embryonate in there. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. So that's what one of the main things I kept this cartoon life cycle on there because then as you can see, once it gets here, we're totally full. So what is that about to tell us? It's oh, it's about to break free and be passed in the feces. Okay, so that shows you how it does have its true body and its skullets up here with its creepy little suckers. Okay, and then as it goes on, it does become tr into true proglottic form. Can more than one break off at a time? No, usually, well, you can have them break off and two are still attached, okay. if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of times people think there's all these tapeworm, like adult tapeworms inside the body. When truly it may just be one or two true worms in there, but we're just releasing all these proglottid as they become gravid. Okay? That's one of the main misconceptions about your tapeworms. Um, and then who else is up there that they have to have? They have to have their intermediate host, which is the flea. Okay? <coughs> and this one also likes to throw in the scary factor or the horror factor for y'all and see who else it throws in there. I don't know if y'all know, but that's a human right there. <laughs> the human can ingest the flea that's infected with the tapeworm and then the tapeworm can develop inside of us. Well, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you would lose weight, but <laughs> I'm going to keep my references to myself. <clears throat> so, diplidium caninum. What is that? Tapeworm. tapeworm, your most common tapeworm. So let's talk about it. Um, it's found in the 
small intestines of dogs and cats. So again, we're still internal intestinal parasites. We like the GI tract. Okay, that's where they want to live and um, grow up. That's where they thrive. The dogs and cats are infected by ingesting fleas. An animal will not be infected with tapeworms without ingesting a flea. Does everyone get that? Okay. The pre-patent period, 14 to 21 days. So there's that two to three weeks. Okay, what does pre-patent period mean? Some, so time from infection to symptoms. As far as symptoms with tapeworms, guess what the first sign of tapeworms is? Not necessarily diarrhea. The perglottids in the poop. Okay, so that whole how long does it take them to get there? That's where our two to three weeks came in. Okay, two to three weeks, 14 to 21 days. Um, and then a lot of people don't think about it, and it's kind of gross to think about, but if you bring your animal in and there's little rasseronis on their, their bottom, um, there's probably rasseronis somewhere else in the house. So people will go back and find them all in the beds. And even if that animal sleeps with you, there's probably going to be some rasseronis in your bed too. Okay? It's just part of it, right? It's because we love our animals and we want them to be with us. Okay? And then you got to be careful those rasseronis don't get around your pillow. And then you know what can happen after that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just trying to gross you all out. Um, <clears throat> so this right here at the bottom, that's obviously several, several perglottids or your rasseroni snacks down there. I don't want to have that person's job. I'm not going to go pick their food yeah. clean it off. Bring me a bunch of perglottids so I can measure it for this picture. <laughs> um, but that is a lot, okay? So they are rice-like. And unfortunately, we do talk a lot about food in this class. It's just easier to compare them. Um, so your TNA tapeworms, um, we're still in our tapeworm um, class or division. These are just some different types of species or breeds. Um, these guys aren't near as common. So your TNA pisiformis is probably going to be your next most common that you can see. And we're going to see it more so in like our hunting dogs or our dogs that like hunt with rabbits or track rabbits. Um, that's probably your next most common. And it's still kind of a stretch because typically we're going to be dealing more with our diplodium canine. Okay. Um, your feline tapeworms, they do have their own specific type of tapeworm. But again, what species do we see even more so in cats? With tapeworms? Diplidium caninum. Okay, even though it says caninum, you can still see that in our feline patient. And even though there is a true feline tapeworm, we typically see diplidium caninum, caninum in our dogs and cats. Most common. They do look similar, yeah. <coughs> Are y'all over talking about tapeworms yet? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Anna. So, do you have to know the exact species every time? Or you just have to know the tapeworm? You just need to know the phylum most commonly um, because we're going to treat them all the same. Yeah. And we know that most commonly we're going to deal with here is diplodium canonum because that's, we have fleas like crazy here because we have humid weather. It's kind of cold today, but it's not usually cold enough to get rid of everything completely. So where we have all those bugs, we're going to have intermediate hosts for other diseases. Um, but they're going to all be treated the same. <coughs> so here's some more pictures. Um, what do you, this right here is just trying to show you like what the egg looks like outside of the body. Okay, what is this right here that you see? It is an egg. What's this right here? Hookworm. That's a hookworm. Okay, and then what's this right here? That's one of these creepy, like, random, super rare versions of a tapeworm. But it almost, to me, looks like this tapeworm egg has broken, and then that's just, like, the inside uh, parts of it. Hmm? They do kind of look like individual roundworms. So how could you tell that this is, like, not just individual roundworms and it's part of a tapeworm? Because there's a dark center. Yeah, so your roundworms have a dark center, and your roundworms are going to be about this whole size together. Like, these are a little bit smaller. And then you do have your little nucleus in here, but then you can still see that they're connected, that connective membrane in there as well. They almost look to me about the size of coccidia too, um, which we'll talk about that next class. Um, but your coccidia nuclei is gonna be a little bit different. And this is a super, super rare occasion. So that's probably why they took this picture and put it in a book, right? Because 
we don't get to see it very often. Okay? Did all of y'all have fun at the winter meeting that got to come? Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah. It, I mean, it's cool. I, the only reason, that, what made me think of that is us talking about that putting in a book and how that one guy knew Dr. McKernan, the guy that like, wrote y'all's McKernan book. Mm -hmm. Were y'all in there for that guy's talk, the mm -hmm. fifth foster guy? He didn't get to go um, to the talk to the vet. No? Anyway. He like knows him. I don't know. Not that I'm starstruck because it's just like a really big book that y'all use. But also with his talk, I um he was supposed to talk about like personalities in the workplace. Like that was what his first little thing was supposed to be. And I was really excited about that because I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this personality testing. He's gonna tell me the type that I am and like who I work well with or whatever. I don't know if y'all thought that, but that's what I thought it was gonna be. And it was just like the history of like. Yeah, we did too. We looked after that one. Okay. Yeah, like I thought I was about to get to learn like how it worked. Like you're number three and you're number seven and threes and sevens. That's what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Which, I mean, he made good points for sure, but it's just not what he advertised it to be, I guess. Um, and I don't know why I went on that tangent just now to talk to you about that. But anyway, so this is our paper. And it's more oval ellipsoid type. Okay. So here's just another um, life cycle image for y'all to look at. <coughs> right here we have our rabbit. What does our rabbit act as in this one? Intermediate the intermediate host. Who's our intermediate host for diplodium caninum? The flea. The flea. Okay. There's a reason I asked you all that over and over and over again because it's, it's very important that you know it and you probably will see it again multiple times. <coughs> okay. Um, we're going to skip over these guys. Okay. So... These guys are going to be found more in like your tissue type um, samples. Um, your e granulosis is going to be for your dogs. These are going to be more on the rare side. We talk about them because there is some zoonotic potential here. Um, <coughs> we're not going to spend a ton of time on them though because it's not something that we deal with very often um, in veterinary medicine. Okay. Um, this down here. So this part here is a fecal sample. What do you think these samples are? Do you have any guesses? Blood stain. Potentially blood stain. This one to me actually looks like a histopath of some sort. Like it was tissue that they took and stained and let it dry and then stained it and it uptook. Because all of these right here you see are muscles or cells of the tissue. Well, yeah, but you were able to see that it's not, it's, they're stained to it. So it wasn't like. Okay, but we're not going to spend a ton of time on them. Um, here's some. Here's a tiny tapeworm. Um, the whole thing is composed of three proglottids: one mature, one kind of mature, or one immature, a mature one, and a gravid one. Okay, which one's the gravid one? You think? The big, the big fat one. one. The big fat one. So it's the really mature one that's about to disconnect. Okay, and then what's this right here? The head, or what's that other word? It's called skullet. Okay, good. Um, so your horse and ruminants, they can get tapeworms. It's not super, super common to find them um, in your horse patients or your cows. Those of y'all that work in large animals, y'all see a lot of tapeworms. Huh? Yeah, so it's not super common. <coughs> but if you do find them, here's a nice image of them. Um, again, it's really, really, really rare that you find tapeworms. Typically, we're gonna, what are we going to be seeing in our large animal patients? We talked about them in nematodes. Uh, yeah, so strongyles. Remember in our strongyloidy family, um, we call them strongyles in large animal, and then small animal, they're <coughs> called what? Hookworms. Okay, they're still all in the strongyloid super family. Um, and then with some of our horses that we'll get, you can see some pinworms as well, okay? So tapeworms in humans. So let's get a little bit scarier. Um, so there is some that you can get from beef and there's some that you can get from pork. Um, some people just say beef measles, some people say pork measles, okay? But really you just have the tapeworm from the two, okay? And you can, any guesses on how you get them? From meat. From meat. Okay, so that's where we talk about, you know, hey, make sure your food's cooked, especially chicken, for sure. But especially some of your, some beef people, 
And I don't know if anybody, because my husband does it too, but he likes his steaks like super, super rare. <laughs> like, I think if it would probably still probably move, maybe. Um, and me, that stresses me. Like, if I even see, like, a tiny, tiny bit of pink, it stresses me out. Because I teach this class. So I see. I mean, granted, I know they have to go through all these FDA testing and blah, 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 blah. Ew. But, yes. Cook your food. Okay? Cook your meats. Wash your hands really well after you handle raw or uncooked meat. Because there are a lot of things looming out there that you don't know about. Okay. Um, so, small animal used to used to Sorry. Um, these guys are going to be found more in your rodents. Okay, so like your mice, your rats. Anyone in here have mice or rat pets? I used to have rats. Rats. Did you ever have parasite problems with them, like intestinal parasites? So they're not typically, like, especially if you go from a pet store or a breeder, they do have pretty good implementations on parasite control on your little pocket rodents. Um, very rare do you have one come in that does have true parasites. And if you do, a lot of times it is a parasite of a dog or cat that just accidentally found its way in a rat, and the animal's just sick because the, the worm's not viable anymore. What? Parasite with guinea pigs, yeah. And, well, not necessarily it's small now. But your guinea pigs, too, they have other types of parasites that are a little bit harder to get rid of. And some of your, like, corporate places, um, I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but some of your corporate chain pet stores let some stuff slip through the cracks to have the flash so they can increase the money-making ability. And we'll just leave that back. So that's going to be one of your main ones you'll see in your rats. Um, zipper tapeworms. Um, the only reason they're called that is because they do unzip like a zipper. Um, so like on your true tapeworms, we have them coming off the end. Your zipper tapeworms, they come off like this. So like you're unzipping a zipper and then they detach. Okay. That's the only thing I really want y'all to remember about that type of pseudo tapeworm is they unzip along their long axis. Um, so here's some yummy pictures. More to look at. Um, what's this picture up here make y'all think of? Fettuccine. Fettuccine noodles, right? <laughs> it does. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness, how could you look at that and tell that's a pseudo and not a true tapeworm? The nasty one up at the top. It has the ridges, so it's trying to say, hey, I look like a true tapeworm, but we don't have the true, like, fold or segments. Okay? Um, and then here's some pseudo tapeworm eggs. How would you tell this the difference between this one and a roundworm? <laughs> this one's a lot more oval. Okay? And then you do kind of, how would you make sure that's not a whipworm, though? Because it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the what are those called? Polar, Polar plugs. Polar plugs. Yeah. him and 
we found these little um, flukes in him. They look just like this, okay? A lot of your reptiles, especially the reptiles that come out of pet stores, will have these. Hmm? That's a good question. Um, it could have been something that either we fed him and it maybe came through the food or something that he had when we got him and he just never really showed symptoms of it. Because some of the reptile, especially some of the reptile parasites, you can see them, have them for a long time before they ever show any kind of symptoms of it. They kind of just all live in harmony. Can they get them through like bad vegetables? Mm -hmm. like yep, yep. That's how a lot of your reptiles become infected with parasites. Um, it's through their ve vegetation and what we're feeding them. Like parasites are, the vegetables and fruit weren't washed properly and they were inside that. Um, and that's why a lot of, I don't know if y'all think about it when y'all do kennel duty, but make sure y'all wash the, the stuff we give them too. I try to before we put it up, but. Um, do what? We, um, Dr. Coley ordered him some kind of meds. I can't even remember the name of it. And we just treated him one time and he was fine. <coughs> that was like, I want to say almost three years ago, probably when that happened. I have a dragon at home. That's but his, his fecal sample looked just like this one. Like, mm -hmm. it was crazy. Um, we put them on there. And it was almost a little bit stunning that he had so many. And we didn't even know. Yeah. Um, but we ordered some kind of dewormer for him. But I cannot remember for the last of me what the name of it was. I know it was expensive. Yeah. Um, and then it, and then it like expired really fast. Cause we don't, I mean, we don't see reptiles. We just have them here. Um, and something like that, you don't really do. You don't use it like regularly, like you would with cats and dogs. But yeah. Anyway, but he did have these little trematode um, fluke guys in his stool. Um, the intestinal fluke of dog and cats. It's super rare that we have dogs and cats getting flukes. Um, who do you think we see flukes in more often? Do you think small animal or large animal? Why would you think large animal? Right, because they're always grazing. They always have their mouth on the grass. Flukes like moist environments. So we have ponds. Here we've had a ton of rain. Um, and with our, our uh, horses and our cattle, especially our cattle, some of our goats even, I mean, they're constantly <coughs> grazing. Okay, so we do see that more commonly in them. <clears throat> and then this little dude at the bottom, he's going to be more so in the Mississippi Delta area. That's going to be more from the swamps of Louisiana, so we're not going to see that specific parasite a lot here. Okay, that's something that they probably deal with more because um, they're right there um, by the swamp. <clears throat> so here's just some more pictures. There's you another lung fluke. Would you be able to look at this and tell that that's not a round worm, hookworm, or whipworm? This guy right here. They do kind of look, they kind of do, but they don't have the polar plugs. The first thing I notice about flukes is they have like this flat side. They almost look like a really rounded arrowhead to me. Like they have a blunt end and then they kind of point out. It looks like a okay. Christmas lot. Like yeah, off. so like they like he has this flatter end and then he's round. <coughs> okay. And then typically too, when you're dealing with a true fluke infestation, you probably will see more than one. And the symptoms of your animal will kind of help guide you to which way to look. Okay. <coughs> I think I talked about it with y'all a little bit in breeds, but your patient is like your max. That's like your treasure map, okay? Whatever your patient is showing you or doing, symptom-wise, that's going to be your map to look for <coughs> when you're doing your diagnostic testing, okay? Are y'all with me on that? So if you have an animal coming in and it's having loose stool, but it's not super, super bloody loose stool, and you do a fecal sample, you may not be thinking, oh, there's for sure going to be hookworms on here. Because we know that there's going to be blood a lot of times with hookworms because why? Right, because they hook on and latch onto the lining of the intestines. Okay, with your tapeworms, they may be passing stool that's perfectly formed, but what's going to be in it? Oh, the proglottids are going to be in there. Okay, when we start talking about hematology, your dogs are going to present a certain way to make you look for a certain thing on your blood smear. Okay, whether it's a parasite or a disorder or whatever, that animal is going to be your instructions or your roadmap to your diagnostic testing. Okay, so just remember that going forward. If you 
you can't find something, you can't figure it out, look at what your patient's doing. Look at your symptoms that your that your patient's dealing with. Okay, and with like flukes and lung flukes, um, we know that's not super common around here. So that's where those history taking that we talked about in breeds, that's where getting a good history is going to come in handy too. Okay. <coughs> so here's your liver fluke of a cow, um, sheep, and other ruminants. There's your egg version, and then here's like your fluke version. Okay, so what do you think this part down here is? That's one of your little suckers, right? That's the mouth part. And then what's all this down here? That's the other, remember it had that other ventral sucker? Okay, that's that back portion. Okay, why would they need those suckers? To get their nutrients and what else? Attach, keep them where they are, right? If they have attached themselves somewhere, they want to stay there and they don't want to move. Okay, and then that's your egg version over there. Um, Y'all don't worry about any of those guys. Those are just a bunch of flukes, okay? The main thing I want y'all to remember about flukes is remember they're in trematodes. That's the main thing I want y'all to get from flukes is that they're trematodes, okay? And that they're still in this phylum because they're dorsoventrally flattened, okay? That's why they ended up in this phylum with us. Um, our acanthos, the only thing I want y'all to remember about them is that they're thorny-headed worms. The acantho portion of that word is describing the thorny headedness. Okay? Um, they're very uncommon to see in veterinary medicine. Um, a lot of times they're only recovered at necropsy of the animal, the adult anyway. Okay, so this will be post mortem or after the animal has died. Okay? Okay, so of all of this that we just talked about, who's the most important you think? Diplidium caninum, it's a common name. The true tapeworm. Okay, what's the difference between a true tapeworm and a pseudo tapeworm? Your proglottis, or your main component. Okay, your, your pseudo tapeworms don't detach themselves. They try to pretend like they do, but they don't. Okay, your pseudo tapeworms also have centrally located reproductive organs. Your true tapeworm, where are their reproductive organs? In each individual proglottis. Okay? Does the tapeworm have an indirect or direct life cycle? <laughs> indirect because why? <laughs> they have an intermediate host, which is the flea. Right. Um, did everybody get one of these? Okay. So Thursday in class, we will do chapter <coughs> excuse me, 47. That's going to be our rickettsia. Protozoan guys, so like Giardia and our Coccidia guys are going to be in there. And then I'll try to, if I can find time tomorrow and before class on Thursday, figure out when we'll do due dates and stuff for parasites and